Trump 2020 attorney spars with CNN host over presidential poll. From Politico, the senior legal advisor to President Donald Trump's 2020 campaign on Sunday condemned CNN's recent presidential poll as misleading junk science in a contentious interview on the network. The Reliable Sources interview, lasting more than 10 minutes, consisted largely of the advisor, Jenna Ellis, and CNN host Brian Stelter scolding, yelling, and speaking over each other. At the heart of the dispute was a CNN poll released last Monday that showed former President Joe Biden, the presumptive Democratic nominee, leading Trump by 14 points among registered voters. So this was a really horrible, horrible interview. I'll leave a link to it in the description. You can watch it. It's hilarious. Brian Stelter does a terrible job. He acts like a total asshole. And this is all about the polling that CNN did. Now, I looked into the polling for this, and it was garbage, you know. But, I mean, what do you expect? Now, there were points that were made on both sides that were fair. Uh, one of the main ones that the advisor for Trump talked about was this poll <laughs> didn't even ask registered voters, it was all people. Now, when polling companies are supposed to put out uh, polling numbers for an election, you should probably go with registered voters or likely voters, something like that. In this case, they just asked the general population, which doesn't necessarily reflect uh, who's going to vote. But to be fair, most of those people, the vast majority of them, were registered voters. Were they likely voters? We don't know because that wasn't even figured into the calculation. Now, one thing that you can do with these polls is it's pretty easy to manipulate uh, who you ask and to get the outcome that you want. Now, I'm just going to give you a couple examples. These are totally made up, okay? But I think that they will illustrate it. If likely voters in the fall if it's generally split 50 50 between men and women and you do a poll and 75 percent of who you poll are women it's probably not the best representation can we agree with that uh, also likewise let's say it's split a third republican a third democrat and a third independent that those are who vote in the elections and you do a poll and you have 50% Democrat and 25% Republican and 25% Independent, it's probably not going to be as accurate as you think it's going to be. And that's what happened in this poll. Um, they do make calculations afterwards, so if you oversample one group, you can, you can do a little math and fix that. But only 50% of the people that were polled uh, identified as white non-Hispanic, whereas in the last election, 75% of the people that actually went out and voted were white non-Hispanic. I know that you can make up for that, uh, for little discrepancies, you can make up for that by doing a little math. Not that much math, okay? This is, this is a junk poll, and it was right to call it out. Brian Stelter was really embarrassing his actions in this interview, and I just want to make it clear, okay? I'm not on Team Trump at all. But if you have an interview and you've got Brian Stelter of CNN and a Trump advisor going at each other and I'm agreeing almost entirely with the Trump advisor, you're doing it wrong. CNN, you're doing this wrong. This is the wrong way to go about it. The whole thing was embarrassing. Now, I do have many other stories that I'm going to get to in just a minute, but I wanted to talk about one thing that was a real positive thing for me over the weekend. I went for a long bike ride, and I listened to a podcast by Sam Harris. He's got a podcast, uh, Making Sense with Sam Harris, episode 207, 207. And the title of the podcast is, Can We Pull Back from the Brink? Now... 
It's very long. It's almost two hours. He talks very slow, slowly. And that's a little painful. But I promise you that you are going to have a better understanding of what's going on with police violence and, uh, and society as a whole if you give this podcast a listen. I think it's really important. I don't think that there was much new information for me, but I think that he did a, a pretty good job of laying everything out in a way that was clear and understandable. So that's my recommendation. I'll leave a link for that podcast in the description. But that's my recommendation that if you have some time this week, please listen to that podcast. I think that it's really, really important. From the Washington Post, prosecutors say the heap of $6 million in crisp new bills fastened in bundles with pink and yellow rubber bands was supposed to bribe a Ukrainian anti-corruption investigator to drop an embezzlement case against the founder of the natural gas company Burisma. To Ukrainians, the pile was eye-popping, and not just because it was so large. In this country, plagued by, for decades by corruption, such payments normally change hands quietly without anyone finding out. But here it was, seized by law enforcement officials and proudly displayed in transparent plastic bags by the director of the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine and the Special Anti-Corruption Prosecutor. Details of the case emerged Sunday in a Kiev court. Authorities said an anti-corruption bureau official was paid $6 million to drop the investigation against Burisma founder Mykola Zhashevsky, a former ecology and natural resources minister, in an elaborate sting operation Friday. Local media reported it took 12 hours to count the cash. The special anti-corruption prosecutor ruled out involvement by Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden or his son Hunter. <laughs> now this is very interesting and it's also interesting that this isn't big news. But to catch the founder of Burisma in a six million dollar bribe to end a corruption investigation sounds very very familiar. As you remember the entire impeachment was based on uh, Trump having a phone call looking into Biden when Biden dropped, or he didn't drop, but Biden persuaded a prosecutor in Ukraine to drop an anti-corruption case. This is eerily familiar, very, very similar. They did go out of their way to say that Joe Biden and his son Hunter have nothing to do with this, and... They probably have nothing to do with this, but it does bring up questions that if the founder of the company is doing these bribes to get out of anti-corruption cases, we really need to go back and look at what happened with Burisma while Joe Biden was president. I think that it is shameful that the U.S. media has not done much investigation into this and they haven't really covered that story they gloss over it and say there's nothing to see here nothing to see here but i think there's a lot to see here <laughs> aoc plans to skip in-person debate with democratic primary challengers from the new york post aoc is going awol for the city's only in-person debate ahead of next week's democratic party primary first time rep Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez from Queens in the Bronx plans to skip out on a face-to-face -face showdown with three challengers Wednesday, her office told The Post. Ironically, the Parkchester Times-sponsored debate is the same one the previous incumbent, 10-time rep Joseph Crowley, shirked in 2018. The deep blue 14th district has not elected a Republican since its lines were drawn in 1993. So the winner of its June 23rd Democratic primary will almost certainly become the next representative in Congress. Early voting began Saturday and a record 300,000 mail-in ballots, a number drastically swollen by coronavirus concerns, 
has gone out to city voters. Now, this is really rich, I've got to say. If you watched the documentary about uh, AOC, I think take, take Down the House, Take Back the House, something like that, uh, I thought it was a, a pretty good documentary. But it was about the just the audacity of this congressman to not show up for a local debate. And then she went out and campaigned on that. Look, this guy won't even show up to debate. You know, I represent you, I represent you. And now how times have changed. Because now that she is the representative, she is also refusing to have a head-to-head -head debate for uh, the district. Now, they have had some like Zoom debates uh, in the past uh, via video conferencing and things like that. But this was going to be the only head-to-head -head in person debate. For her to not show up for it tells me that she's scared and this is a campaign tactic and she's using the same campaign tactic <laughs> that happened last time and it didn't work, right? <laughs> so yeah, this is going to be interesting, but we will likely know uh, very soon who's going to be the congressperson from that district. U.S. Surgeon General, coronavirus face masks promote freedom from CNN, of all places. The U.S. Surgeon General on Sunday urged people to wear face coverings, saying they will promote freedom during the coronavirus pandemic. Dr. Jerome Adams pushed back on the idea that face coverings infringe on freedom, saying they're important to slow the spread of coronavirus and reopen the economy. Quote, some feel face coverings infringe on their freedom of choice, but if more wear them, we'll have more freedom to go out. Surgeon General Adams wrote in a tweet Sunday morning. Now, I've got to say that I am impressed by this current Surgeon General. I'm not saying you have to wear it everywhere you go, but if you go into a grocery store or in a confined place, you put on the mask, it's not a big deal. It is really tough because we don't we don't know what we don't know everything about this pandemic. And there's a lot of different opinions on what's best. Now for me, I would like to err on the side of caution. That's me. But in many ways, it's just being polite, right? We don't know what's exactly best, but wearing face masks does make sense. And I like to think of it as showering, right? Like, you don't have to shower, right? You can stink. You can be a disgusting human being if you want to and, and never shower and go out. But it's gross to everybody else. And so if you're going out and you stink, take a shower first. If you're going to go on public transit and you smell really bad, take a shower because there are other people in the society and we don't want to have to smell you. Likewise, if you're going out someplace that you're going to be in a confined space, just put on a mask while you're there, while you're in the grocery store or while you're in the light rail. It's not that big a deal and you really look out for everyone else. I know I'll probably get a little hate for that opinion, but that's just how I feel on it. And lastly, thousands signed petition to replace Confederate statues in Tennessee with Dolly Parton from the Hill, quote, history should not be forgotten, but we need not glamorize those who do not deserve our praise. Instead, let us honor a true Tennessee hero, Dolly Parton, Alex Parsons, who started the petition wrote, aside from her beautiful music, which has touched the hearts and lives of millions of Americans, Dolly Parton's philanthropic heart has unquestionably changed the world for the better. Tennessee in particular has been in the spotlight as well, as several of its monuments honor Nathan Bedford Forrest, who ordered the massacre of 300 black soldiers at Fort Pillow during the Civil War, and was later a founder of the KKK. So, I know there's lots of stuff going on with statues, uh, statues of the Confederacy. I think that, that, that some of this could be overblown, uh, of like any statue of anyone before 19, 
94 is probably a bad person and it needs to come down. I think we need to, you know, slow down on that a little bit. I don't like people going out and pulling down the statues themselves. I don't think you have the right to do that. I know at the University of Oregon, uh, just over the weekend, some someone went and vandalized and they pulled down the Pioneer. And it was just like a Pioneer that came out west. It wasn't a particular person. Because apparently, you know, everyone in history is bad, I guess. Yeah, Dolly Parton, I can get behind that. Now, I will say that as a general rule, we probably shouldn't put up statues of people until they pass. Because you put up a statue of someone, and then what happens, right? Then they do a dumb tweet, and then they get canceled, and now we got to take the statue down, and it's a whole big thing. So it's probably better to honor them after they, they pass away. But whatever. I would love to have a statue of Dolly Parton. Um, I think that'd be fun. I don't live in Tennessee. I've never been to Tennessee, but if I visited Tennessee, I'd definitely check out a, a statue of Dolly Parton. Anyway, those are my thoughts on these stories for today. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Peace. Thank <laughs> you.